of you who are at home, welcome wherever you are. We welcome you to Central Baptist Worship this morning. It is great to be here to worship our God. So please stand for those who are with us. <laughs> please stand at home too. We're going to sing about our great and amazing and wonderful and awesome God who is worthy of our praise this morning. Lord, we thank you 
that we do have the freedom to worship you, to worship you freely, to lift up your name. Lord, you are worthy. You are so worthy of our praise. You are so worthy of this short time that we can give you this morning, Lord. And I pray that we will come with open hearts, that our hearts will be turned towards you and only you for this time that we will hear your voice. Lord, we just pray for any practicalities that need to occur this morning, Lord, with sound, with streaming, with all of that practical side of life. Lord, we ask that everything will run smoothly so that your word may go forth in power and in truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Melinda. Well, I thought um, that we should... I informed the treasurer this morning anyway that I've ordered some aids to help us socially distance a little bit better. He's old-fashioned and he thought a tape measure could do it. But I'll show you what I've ordered. Um, can we have the, the uh, image, please? Uh, here we go. So I've ordered a few of the... No, I haven't. We love that. Social distance, a scunt on a five-foot leg. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. Welcome to Central Baptist this morning as we meet to worship our amazing, trustworthy, true, truthful and reliable God this morning. Here we are in our homes and a few of us are here to sing and to help, all in anticipation of being able to, to meet next week in greater numbers of 50 people. It was to be next week. Take a breath, everyone. Life is not easy. One of our Prime Ministers said that a few decades ago. And our Premier um, yesterday brought us the same news. Life isn't easy. The easing of restrictions has been postponed for another three weeks as the coronavirus seems to have arced up again. So, as an eldership, we've decided to continue to live stream um, from the church on a Sunday morning, gathering as a church online, and with a few extra voices here to just aid the worship uh, that we can have in our homes together. As a body of Christ, we may be scattered in our homes, but we can be together. Today is Communion Sunday, so I invite you all who love the Lord to join us around the communion table. In a little while, uh, Brian Ellis will lead us in that special time with our Lord and Saviour. Rowan Thurman is uh, leading us in prayer today at the last moment. Thank you, Rowan. And uh, Heather Ellis is bringing us the Bible reading um, a little later. We have a children's video on the teaching this morning uh, for the kids, uh, which is always good to watch. As a special thank you um, to Elizabeth too for um, agreeing to do the live streaming and Tony Fielder aiding her in that and Georgia over the, the next few weeks. Bye. Now, let's worship our amazing God in spirit and in truth together. May God's Holy Spirit draw us together as we worship him today. Thank you. Hey kids, do your parents have to wear a uniform when they go to work? Maybe if you're a police officer, or a doctor, or a nurse, or a pilot, or even a football player. Did you know that if you're a Christian, God has a uniform that he wants you to put on? That's right, it's called the Armor of God, and it's a lot different than what a policeman or a doctor would wear. And that's because it's not actual physical armor. It's not like what people wear in movies or shows that protects from arrows or swords. It's six things that help us remember to do the right thing. Let's see what they are. First, the belt of truth. This is what holds the whole uniform together. It helps us know how we should act and treat others. When we're feeling grumpy and acting bad and trying to do our own thing, like being mean to other kids or disobeying our parents, Truth reminds us that instead we should be kind to others and do as our parents ask. Next, the body armor of righteousness. 
This is the piece of the uniform that goes over your chest. It protects your heart. Righteousness is just another word for living the way God wants you to. When we live in a way that God wants us to, it protects our heart from bad stuff. Number three, the shoes of peace. These are obviously for your feet. These help us remember that we don't have to earn God's love. So when life is hard and we don't feel very good about ourselves, we can have peace that God loves us no matter what. Next, the shield of faith. This is for holding up to protect ourselves. And it reminds us that we are saved by faith. So when we have bad thoughts and feelings that take us off track, our faith in Jesus will help protect us. Next, the helmet of salvation. This one goes on your head, of course, and helps you remember that Jesus saved you. Your head is super important, so it's super important to remember that Jesus saved you from your sins. You know, sin, all of that bad stuff that you know, Jesus got rid of it, so you can live in heaven Last, the sword of the spirit. This one you hold in your hand. And it's actually just another way to say the Bible. So when we think that we know better and we want to go out and do wrong, the Bible can remind us to do the right thing instead. See kids, these are all kind of pointing at the same thing. Memory verse. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So kids, if you want the coolest Trust in Jesus. And put on the full armor of God every day. Hi everyone, whether you're here or at home, we come now to uh, prayer time. But before we do that, there's something that I'd like to share with you as an encouragement. I don't know about you, whether you, when you do your Bible reading, um, have a book or something like that that you can jot things down in that kind of jump out at you when you read the scriptures but that's something that I've been trying to do a bit this year and it's great to be able to go back to that and as Andrew said I've um, been called in to do the prayer and it's a privilege to be able to do that but I wanted to share some of the things that I've written in here um, over the course of the year so far that have come out of scripture and I don't know about you but uh, there's times in my life where I feel like my prayers touch the ceiling and bounce back um, we don't always get answers to things straight away sometimes things need to take time to work through sometimes God will just want us to be patient in those things. And when I'm in those times, I kind of just have to rely and just look at who God is and seek Him. And so what I did earlier this year when I was going through a situation like that was that I just wrote down lots of adoration points that I um, have got out of the Bible. And I'm gonna start with this today before we launch into our prayer time. And I hope these are an encouragement to you. So here, here's a, a few. I managed to get four pages, would you believe? Um, these are a few. Lord, you're above all things and powers. You are the great I am. You are the maker of all things. You are holy. You are all-knowing. You are faithful. You are everywhere and available at any time. You are just. You are unchanging. You are full of glory. You are perfect in all your ways. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the transformer of my soul. You are tender-hearted. You never falter, you never get discouraged, you give us hope and purpose, you take hold of our hands and guide us, you honour the covenant you made with us, you are triumphant, you are glorious and powerful, 
you're head of the church, you speak with authority, divine wisdom, penetrating vision, and pure power. Your word cuts through situations like a sharp sword. There's just a few. So when we do that, I, I believe that that bouncing off the ceiling starts to, there's cracks that open up and then we start to not just dwell on ourselves and our own needs, but we actually start to see God and we, he becomes bigger and we become smaller. And that's when we get things in their right perspective. So as we come into this prayer time now, let's, let's pray for the things that are in our, heart, in our world that are going on at the moment and maybe in our hearts as well. Let's do that now. Lord, we ask that you would help us to put on the armour of God in the daily things that take place in our lives. We pray for the message that's going to be shared today. Lord, we're also very mindful of countries worldwide that are doing it much harder than us in terms of COVID-19. And Lord, we pray for them and we pray for us to be patient when we have these minor setbacks uh, that impact our earthly plans. Lord, we uh, want to be committed with Andrew and Dawn as they head off on their well-earned holidays. We thank you for all that they do. We give you thanks and praise for all that Andrew's done, especially during this incredibly busy time. May that be a time of rest for both of them. We pray for those battling ill health in our congregation. Watch over them. We pray for Heather's mum, the Venses, Doug and Pam, Robbie, and Andrew's mum as well, who's not well. And um, also for Noel, and there may be many others that we don't know about. Lord, you know them. Watch over them as well. Use what you've put in our hands, Lord, like you did with Moses. The gifts that we have that are natural and the God-given gifts. May we use them to their full potential. May we be guided by your Holy Spirit daily. May it be a well deep within us, guiding our steps. Lord, you can change hearts. May we be open to follow what you've called us to do in service for you. Our Christian life is never one of a steady incline. It has its ups and downs. Help us not to abandon the pathway and to seek to move forward and upward with your strength and guidance. Lord, use our failures as growth opportunities to draw near to you once again knowing, like the prodigal father, your arms are open wide. Let age not be a barrier to what we can achieve with your guidance. We pray against the powers of darkness that seek to thwart the work of your hands. Thank you for angels that watch over us in the heavenly realms. Help us to overcome darkness with your light shining through us. Give us a boldness, Lord. Thank you that your love is so deep that you bring us back and restore us again. May our communion time today be special in drawing near to you and expressing our challenges and shortfalls. Bless your Lord. Praise your holy name. Amen. Thanks, Ron. We're going to continue in that attitude of prayer. We're going to sing, but um, this morning we are going to sing this song as a prayer. It's an old hymn and often uh, coming up to a service sometimes I have a song that uh, impresses on my heart and if it is remains there the whole week I figure there's a reason for it and this song has been on my heart all week. It's called Be Thou My Vision and many of you will know it but the words have really um, impacted me as I have read them and I think about them. There's a lot of thou's in this song, which can tend to be a little bit um, the kind of thing that can overtake the rest of the words. Is we're not used to thou's. We uh, we don't have that's the, the King James version. But I don't want that to take away from the rest of the words. And so I found a uh, more 
more modern and Google's fantastic for this sort of thing. I Googled up modern, you know, words to be there on my vision here and I came up with this. <laughs> so it's basically just replacing the thou's with you's. But I want to read the words and I want, I want them to soak into you this morning before we sing the song. Um, that there's, a, there's so much of it that is so pertinent to where we are at the moment and for us to truly turn our whole focus and our heart towards him with what is happening in the world, with what is happening and how it is impacting each of our lives. Our true hope, our only hope, is our Lord and that's where we need to leave our vision, that's where we need to leave our hope, that's where our heart needs to be centred. So it says, Lord, be my vision. Be my guiding star. Nothing is more to me, Lord, than you are. You, my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, your presence, my light. You be my wisdom and you my true word. I am with you and you with me, Lord. You, my great father, I, your true son, you in me dwelling, and I with you one. You be my hand shield, my sword for the fight. You be my dignity, you my delight. You my soul's shelter, you my high tower. Raise me up heavenward, O power of my power. I need no riches nor man's empty praise. You're my inheritance now and always, you and you only, first in my mind, <coughs> High King of Heaven, the treasure I find. High King of Heaven, my victory won, may I reach Heaven's joys, O bright Heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Please stand, we're going to sing this, let your heart, I pray that it is your heart's prayer this morning as we sing this together.
I've certainly missed while we've been separated. <laughs> um, today's uh, communion time, I, I do believe it's going to be special because uh, we're celebrating and we're around the Lord's table. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 10 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 10 verse uh, 15 says, I speak as to sensible people. Hey, that's good honouring, isn't it? Sensible people, wise. Uh, judge for yourself what I say, says Paul. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. So, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the bond of love. So those at home, you better get your elements ready, uh, bread and, uh, and some uh, juice ready. That would be good. You know, not seeing your faces over this break has been, you know, a, a missing. You know, it's a loss. I've grieved over not being able to have a hug and see your faces too. Isn't it great? The Lord sees all our faces. That's, and uh, my heart's rejoicing uh, today to see you all. Um, here we are, Christ's body here on earth. So we have a common unity, a community of believers. We have a common unity together. Now, I was um, reading in the NLT, New Living Translation. I'm just going to flip over to that, if you bear with me a moment. And I'm looking at uh, Galatians 3. Right, having a palm, you just click, 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 and I don't hear the pages turning, but that's okay. Uh, 328, Galatians 328, it says, For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know, there's no distinction with God. There's no division with God. That we're all uh, that sense of unity. Colossians three. Look at how quick we go to Colossians. Look at that. Bang, bang, bang. Look at that. Huh? And verse eleven. I love it. It's great. God's <laughs> word just really makes my heart rejoice. And it says here in, in verse eleven, in this new life which we have in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. That's good news. That's exciting when we're believers in Christ. He's in us and we are hid in him. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. This is good, good for walking in Christ even in our days today. Clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And I want it now, Lord. Patience. <laughs> Make allowance for each other's faults. Thank you for forgiving me. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And that's so important. I had an opportunity to talk at our camp over this week at school. And uh, forgiving me those that uh, have uh, offended you and, and overlooking offences was something that really stood out and it comes here again. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Well, there's lots of division happening in the world today, but we as a body of Christ, we hold on uh, firmly to one another. There's uh, separation, yep, but not division uh, among us. In our diversity in, in the body of Christ, let's love one another because we are one in Christ. Uh, love your brethren, that's you all. Love your enemy. Love God and love your neighbour. We've had opportunities to love our neighbours a lot over the, the time. Our unity in Christ must be maintained, maintained most of all, 
Uh, it requires separation from the world, but being in the world. Separation from evil, but letting love rule in our heart. Not thinking of ourselves more highly than we should. Putting on humility with the bond of peace and love. Now, there are elements at work in the world that would seek to rob, kill and destroy the body of Christ. And we are under great persecution in the world. So as we remember Jesus this morning, let's remember his body in the world as well and pray for the unity of the saints. Remember them as we commune today. Remember other parts of our body, unique parts, uh, less pretty parts, less lovely parts that are suffering around the world today. Don't let division separate and divide but work at maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of love. And Jesus uh, would have us maintain his body happening in the world. Wouldn't you know it?
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all and those that are here and those that are at home. Um, may I just first take a moment to thank you all for praying for um, my mum. She's doing well at this point and uh, it's been quite a journey for her and for all the family. But just thank you again for all your prayers. Um, God is at work. It's wonderful. This morning I'm reading from Acts chapter 19 verses 1 to 20 and then I will continue with uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 13. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. The riot in Ephesus. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. And now the reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. shadows over us 
the things that loom over us, cast shadows over us. What are they? The coronavirus? The second wave? Political revelations this week um, causing huge turmoil in the government. Apparently you can stack branches pretty high, maybe about this high I reckon, and I think they cast really long shadows. The racial unrest sweeping the globe. The police question. The question of rewriting history by removing memorials and statues of true events. Good and bad. Youth gangs. Violence. Teen murder. Football casts a, a shadow for some. Sexual abuse casts a pretty dark shadow. Nothing pretty about it. Family violence, similar shadow. Crime and dark, drug abuse in our communities. Long, wide and dark shadows that just and that's just a very quick scan of Thursday's paper. That's what's happening in the world. What on earth is going on? We're all asking. How is the world coming out of this coronavirus crisis? Or if we aren't coming out of it yet, then how are we dealing with it? Tell me if I'm wrong. But it looks to me that the world is coming out of it. Swing punches. There are punches being thrown like we have never seen or haven't seen in a very long time. A lot of people are reaching for a fight. Nations and countries are looking for a fight. Fights are being picked left, right and centre in the schools, on the streets, in the media, in the United Nations, nation against nation, state against state, minority group against minority group, minority group against all, all against a minority group. After the shock, the blame game begins, it seems, and it can get ugly. In Thursday's paper, one journalist makes a comment in his column has this country gone out of its mind? Everywhere we look, hysterics, offence takers, skulls, liars and race hustlers run riot. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the early mid 20th century preacher and former medical doctor, who, by the way, lived through the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Sadly, he lost his brother to the virus. Well, he understood the reality of pandemics firsthand. And when he preached on this passage, he said, we always seem to be feeling our own pulses and talking about our own selves and our own moves. He says, for now, Forget your troubles and temporary ills. Forget them for the moment and fight in the army. Forget them and fight in the army. That's God's army, I think he's talking about. In our Ephesians passage, we've got to remember that Paul is in a tough place, in lockdown, in a lot tougher situation than our lockdown, for the coronavirus. He was a real man writing to real people in a real time. He was writing to the people in Ephesus who he had visited and spent three years with. Both Luke and Acts, in Acts, and Paul himself in Ephesians, our, our readings this morning, tell us about some of that visit. He came and set about giving a faithful explanation of Jesus to them. That would be the gospel. Paul seeks out believers first. When he, when he hits any new city, he would always seek out the believers first. And he finds 12 of them. They're, they're, they're sort of believers, sort of disciples, in a sense halfway to being Christians. He was... A, he was honest, 
He had an honest conversation with them and he finds out first that they were baptised into John the Baptist's baptism of repentance. But they didn't really know anything much about Jesus and they would never heard of the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling presence of the resurrected Jesus living in you. Paul delivered the truth of Jesus to his, and his accomplishment on the cross to them. They accepted it and believed it. So he baptised them into Jesus. Then he laid hands on them and prayed and the Holy Spirit came and filled them. Paul, with God's power, with his word, got them over the line. They went all the way with Jesus. Simple explanation as I thought about this. When I thought about where they were, where they were at when they met Paul. It was like, it was like a baptism where you stopped halfway through. Like you were there and you went under the water, turning from your old ways and dying to your sins, but then you stop there, never coming up. Spiritual never, spiritually never coming up from the water. Never being raised into a new life with Jesus through his resurrection and his Holy Spirit taking up residence in you. That's God's greatest hope for you. A hope that leads you into eternity with him. God used Paul to get them over the line. Then he began preaching, telling the story of eternal life to the whole city. First he preached in the synagogue for three months until they kicked him out. Then for two years in the Hall of Tyrannus. The Hall of Tyrannus was a Greek school of rhetoric and persuasive speech that was not used in the heat of, in the middle of the day. And nobody worked in the middle of the day, so there were plenty of people available. And Paul was able to use that hall, and he did. Now Ephesus. Ephesus was a significant city. It was no little backwater, that's for sure. Jews and Gentiles rubbed shoulders in the course of daily business. It was cosmopolitan, it was full of wealth. It was a luxury, luxurious place, a productive place, a hive of activity. It had an open air arena that could seat between 20 and 50,000 people. This was some place. But underlying all of this splendour, it was a superstitious place, marked by many pagan notions and beliefs a place of magical notions, potions, practices and spells, sorcery, the occult was big in this city. It was practiced openly and often. This was represented by the Temple of Artemis, or the Temple of Diana, as another name it was called, that was situated there. It was situated high on a hill. It was a seriously spectacular piece of architecture. It was classed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It dominated the culture. The temple bedazzled people with its marble splendour when the sun shone upon it. It also cast a significant large shadow over the whole city because everyone in the city were aware of those dark forces. Many were afraid of them. Of course, you would live and operate your lives in fear of them and they would hold sway over you if you never ever knew anything else or had anything else. They were magical and demonic powers, real powers, satanic powers, limited powers, powers that could suck you in. So for the people who were impacted by the gospel, when they became Christians, their lives radically shifted away from this. Verses 18 and 19 of our Acts reading tell us, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together 
and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. The high price was not due to the quality of the books, but to the supposed power gained by this secret rigmarole of words and names, occult spells were cast using these books. These were significant books and they sold for significant money and they burned them for all to see. Something radical had happened in these people. There was a radical shift. They must have been reasonably wealthy to possess these books. They may have had, had, had them handed down to them through the generations. Their response in their new lives, shouted by their actions, we are never going back into the shadows or aiding others to stay there in the dark. So they burned them, they lit them up. They had a bonfire, a very expensive bonfire that said, this darkness, this shadow of sorcery, fear and control stops right here with us. In the sight of all, something big had happened to these people. Jesus and his Holy Spirit had come in. These magical and evil things are out of their lives, no matter the cost. And it cost a bit. It says 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was a day's wage. If we convert it to today's money, I don't know, 100. $180 per day would be a, a nominal wage these days, multiplied by 50,000. It equals a $9 million bonfire. That's even better than anything Dave Collins could ever organise when he was down on the farm. <laughs> and if you'd ever seen one of his bonfires, they were impressive. This one was impressive and it was outrageously expensive. It was a free will bonfire. They were not going to leave these tools of evil to infect, to corrupt and spiritually enslave others who came after them. It's a beautiful, fiery picture of transformation. Personal sacrifice of giving up something expensive that is destructive to you is a powerful witness to others people do take notice. Everyone who is transferred by grace from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, everyone who becomes a citizen of Christ's kingdom is caught up in a cosmic conflict of eternal significance. Now they had become who they were created to be and they began to live it. You might think they may have thought, wow, how good is this? Here comes a life of ease and relaxation. Now we're over the line. If that's what they thought, they were soon to find out that they were in a battle. They were not transferred to a place of ease and less conflict. They were dropped straight into a hot conflict zone, into a battle. The forces of evil were angry. The battlers played out and fought in the everyday life of believers. In the slings and the arrows of life, in the things that we do every day. It's fought out in the things that matter most to us. Paul, just before this reading we had this morning, he just preached in Ephesians 5 and in the, in the first verses of chapter 6. He preached why it is so hard to be married. Why is it that our children don't turn out just like we had planned? Why can work be so stressful for us? Why is it so hard to be the church in a contemporary world? A big chunk of the answer is this. Not all, but a big chunk that we are up against the schemes of the devil. The evil one himself, he knows exactly where to strike. We must never lose sight of the fact that he is a defeated foe. Mm -hmm. 
this is what dawned on me. That he has been unable to prevent us from becoming the children of God. And he's spewing. So he is doing everything in his power to prevent us from living as children of God. That's the conflict zone. And he uses everything in his power to disrupt us from living that way. That's why life gets difficult sometimes. So we go out into the bonfire of our world and we say, No, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am no longer what I once was. And all hell is let loose against that. They knew. And we have to be aware today that Satan is real. He trades in doubts and division and destruction. He comes at us morally and intellectually. He seeks to rob us of our assurance and our purity. He possesses supernatural power. But it's not unlimited power. It's not that great. But supernatural power nevertheless. Why fight? Because the fact is that Jesus came to, dis to destroy his works. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. He did that on the cross and he did that by his resurrection and his ascension to sit at the seat of power reigning over the entire cosmos. That's where we are today. That's the, um, the phase that we're in. So the powers of darkness are defeated. They are not finally destroyed yet but the victory has been won and it's absolutely assured. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's clearly not destroyed yet because people keep dying. The victory is absolutely assured though. Like checkmate in a chess game. You can win the game. Have a checkmate that cannot be gotten out of because you've won. But the loser can choose. They can choose to concede or to move their pieces around the board, to manipulate the, the pawns and the lesser pieces. But the game is lost. The powerful pieces have already been taken away. It's just a matter of time. Jesus came. He destroyed them on the cross and he rose to life delivering the checkmate of all checkmates. Jesus' side is a victory side. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived as you live out this fight in this world in your everyday life. Let me bring you a quote. It's a message that rings, that rings around the world today. I hear it in schools all the time. Believe in yourself. Have faith in your abilities. Without a humble and reasonable confidence in your own abilities and powers, you cannot be successful or happy. That's not actually the Bible. That's Norman Vincent Peale. That's the power of positive thinking. This passes for Christianity in many places. And you can see why. Alistair Begg makes comment on, the, on this quote. It makes you feel better about yourself and that makes you engage with yourself to find your real self and so on. He asks, have you ever found your real self? How did that make you feel on a rainy Tuesday afternoon when you discovered your real self? When you found your real self? Did you feel amazingly powerful? No. No. He says it's a real crock. I say it's not true. He says it's not true. The power is not found in you. Discovering yourself. 
the power is found in you discovering Jesus Christ. It's a fight. And it's the devil spinning his web of lies. If we are talking fake news, this is it. He is broadcasting to our world. He's broadcasting, oh, I am not real. There is no Satan. There is no evil forces. There is no battle. There is no fight. There was no victory won at the cross or anywhere else. It's all a fairy tale. So just abandon it all. What does Satan want us to abandon? He wants us to abandon righteousness and faith and the shoes of peace and the belt of truth. He wants us to abandon the gospel. That's what he wants us to abandon. And we must not listen to a false gospel. That is no gospel at all. If you give your life to Christ, if you have given your life to Christ, don't be afraid and take heart. He will not ask you to do something that you can't do. He's not asking us to take on a new battle with the enemy. He is saying, you can stand safe and secure in the victory that has already been accomplished on the cross by me for you. Remember when God exhorted jo Joshua, the words say, be strong and courageous as he set him on his way to lead Israel into the promised land. Don't forget the words that he said before that, before the promise. He, he gave his promise. He gave as a basis for that exhortation. God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The complete sentence, I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. It doesn't depend on you. Your true self apart from him. Think about it in these terms. Remember David, in David with David and Goliath. It's at the end, he's won. He chops his head off with his own sword, with Goliath's own sword. The Philistines' armies, they all go running for their lives. And right behind David come all of the soldiers of Israel shouting, We won! We won! We won! Someone says, What do you mean we won? He won! That little guy won! But yeah, he won for us. We share in his victory. Exactly. What do you mean we won? Christ won. Now in Christ we share in his victory. Therefore, when we're encouraged to be strong, to stand firm, it doesn't produce despair in us. It doesn't make us say, oh, but it's impossible for us to do it. The hymn writers always get it right. And we've had a hymn today that had words that got it right. Let me share a couple more with you. It's the second verse of a hymn that we um, may know but don't sing very often. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armour. Each piece put on with prayer. When duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for fighting the darkness and winning the battle for us. A fight we could never win on our own. Lord, may we turn to you and leave behind those things that control and plague our lives. May we live in victory, the hard-won victory that you won for us. May we put on your armour as we live our lives. May we never relinquish your righteousness, your faith, faith in you, peace, your word, as we live out our lives 
as husbands and wives, as sons and daughters, as employees and employers, as your church in a difficult world. May we see who the enemy is and look to you for help, for all we need. Thank you for promising us you will never forsake us or never leave us. So we truly can be strong and courageous in your victorious power. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have a song. Can we have the. Um, yeah. All right, let's stand together as we finish our service, declaring that the Lord is our strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. You are my hope. Hope like no other. Jesus' name. Go in peace. Amen.